Welcome to Lyme Time. I'm Allie from the Tick Chicks. We are all more than Lyme disease and chronic illness, and together we stand with you to overcome and rise. I'll bring you closer to the experts in cutting edge treatments and even a few unexpected ways of healing. I'll ask the questions you want answers to regarding Lyme disease and successful ways of getting you closer to 100%. We are in this together and will not be defined by Lyme. Today's guest, I'm very excited to have Dr. Casey Kelly with us. And she is truly an amazing human being and um, integrative medicine doctor. So I'm gonna just read a little bit about her first and then we will welcome her. Um, Dr. Kelly is board certified in family medicine and she was among the first physicians to become board certified in integrative medicine. She has studied the causes, effects, and treatments of disease extensively and lectures nationally on this and other topics. Dr. Kelly graduated from the Ohio State University College of Medicine and completed her residency in family medicine at St. Joseph Hospital in Chicago. She is a 10-year member of the Institute of Functional Medicine, IFM, a director on the board of the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society, which is ILADS, and is a founding member of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, AIHM. Prior to founding Case Integrative Health, Dr. Kelly practiced medicine at Whole Health Chicago, Michigan Avenue Immediate Care, and St. Joseph Hospital. So thank you, Dr. Kelly, for joining us. I'm very excited to jump in. Excited to be here. Thank you for having me. A lot of our listeners request um, integrative medicine met a doctors because they're not known to a lot of our listeners. A lot of our listeners go directly with the conventional medicine first, and that's just where they have been directed traditionally to go. And so they always are so curious about ILADS doctors and integrative medicine and how that could possibly be of more help than conventional medicine. So I know that you had have actually Lyme disease and possible co-infections. Can you tell me where, just a bit about that journey? Yeah, it's, it's not all that different than most everybody else's. You know, I was sick for quite a while, didn't know what it was, um, slowly got worse and worse and got diagnosed with all kinds of stuff that wasn't even necessarily right, like asthma because of my shortness of breath and air hunger from lovely baby Sia. Um, Diagnosed with POTS when I was in medical school. Went through that whole rigmarole with the tilt table study, which is one of the most god awful tests known to man. Um, oh. um, and it wasn't. It wasn't really until actually I was out practicing medicine on my own when I really started to learn more about what Lyme disease was and that I might actually need to test myself for it. And that's kind of that's how I got in there, which is kind of funny if you think about it because I just. I didn't really know about it. They didn't really teach us much about it in med school mm -hmm. um, and certainly didn't hear about it all in residency or in the Midwest. Um, so it was definitely a lot of me searching out on my own what could possibly be. That does not anything. surprise me in the least. Um, <laughs> a lot of us share that same sentiment. And, and would you consider yourself, how would you consider yourself managing the line now? Currently? I feel I'm like, yeah, I feel like I'm in remission. So it's under very, very good control. As long as I can kind of stay on top of my stress and my sleep and make sure that I'm not stress eating, <laughs> yes. um, then I can stay on top of it. And it's, yeah, it's, I've gotten myself to a much, 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 much better place. So it took a while, oh. but I'm here. The yeah. stress eating and COVID. Huh? What a combination. Right? Yes. I know uh -huh. everyone in the planet is going through that right now. So why did you open your um, case integrative health in Chicago? I needed to go out on my own. I had lots of really big ideas about different ways to care for not only tick-borne patients, but chronic infections in general, chronic disease in general, excuse me. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of therapies and a lot of ideas and, and things that I wanted to bring to patients and have that accessible. And I couldn't do it where I was. And I needed to kind of branch out and build it and bring it to patients so that it could come out of my brain and start to exist in the real world and, and, and have that space to help people really get healthy. Was it just an intuitive 
thing that you had going on because you weren't necessarily taught that um, in your medical history? Uh, the integrative side of yes. things, like kind yes. of dig, dig into that. Yeah. So the integrative side of things, I've, I've kind of always been in integrative medicine and it, it really did start in med school. I got very frustrated that no one was really asking why people were sick. We were good at diagnosing what they had and giving them a pill, but no one was asking why. And it just kind of, you know, spilled out into residency and other things. And, you know, even things like diabetes, like why aren't we talking to them about why do you have diabetes? Is there genetics at play? What's your diet look like? What's your exercise? Instead, we're just given a medicine and then more medicine and then more medicine. I was really frustrated by that whole thing. And, you know, the system that our body is a system, it doesn't work by itself. So the brain is not by itself. The heart is not by itself. The gut is not by itself. They all talk to each other. It's all one piece of one system. So it doesn't make sense to me to compartmentalize it like that. So I started seeking out other conferences and like-minded doctors who are out there treating things more holistically. And it just, once you start to pull that string, it just unravels and you're like, this makes so much sense. And there's so much evidence and science behind it. Um, so much. But, yeah. So much. And, and that leads me to my next question, which is, can you tell our listeners a little bit about the difference between an integrative medicine doctor and an ILADS certified doctor? Yeah, so you can be both, actually. And ILADS actually has a really large portion of its members um, who are integrative, integratively minded. So, so the two things. So ILADS is the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society. It's a medical society designed to teach physicians and other providers how to treat Lyme disease using science and evidence-backed methods um, to treat these chronic infections. And not just Lyme, it's tick-borne infections in general. So, and, you know, we learn about, and we teach docs and other providers how to use medications, um, but also the other side of things. So there's a lot of integrative education that happens as well, diet, supplements, herbs, even. Um, an integrative doctor is somebody who is going to look at the body holistically. And you can be an integrative doctor and be a gastroenterologist, which is a stomach doc, or a neurologist, or a family doc, like I am. I'm a general practitioner. And it's just a matter of starting to look at why people are sick and seeing how things are all interconnected. And integrative docs realize that, you know, not only is there a mind-body connection between everything too, um, but also, you know, there's a lot of our chronic issues are cellular in, in nature or hormonal in nature. And they're not necessarily just because you have GI symptoms, it's coming from your gut. It could be coming from your brain and vice versa because the whole system talks to itself and works together. So integrative docs try to integrate all of that stuff. And we also are open to alternative therapies as well. You know, whatever's best for the patients. There are thousands of years of medical history out there of things like acupuncture and things that, that can really, really help people. And there's a lot of really interesting support that we can help to give patients in that aspect as well. So it's a little right. long-winded. I wish there were like a, a quick you know, <laughs> elevator speech for that, but it's kind no, of hard to explain that. It's perfect to explain it. And then what about an LLMD? Is, is that any different than either of those? So an LLMD is a Lyme literate medical doctor. Um, and, you know, it's, there's not like a certificate for an LLMD. So if a doctor has been treating Lyme for 10 years, they could probably call themselves an LLMD if they're, you know, out there in the, in the trenches kind of treating all of this. Um, a lot of times, though, it's used as people who are members of ILADS, people who are going, you know, through that training. Um, and um, there are preceptorships and things through ILADS where doctors can get more and more training. And we're working on building a certificate through, through ILADS as well so that there is, you know, a certificate program where people can say they've been through the training. Got it. Okay, let's talk cytokine storms. What do our Lyme patients need to know about that and how all of that goes on in our bodies? Sure. The cytokine storm is what happens in reaction to things. So let me step back. For example, if you get an infection um, and the virus, a virus or a bacteria comes into your system, your body's going to react to that as it should. It's trying to help protect you from that. But what happens then is you get this release of messenger signals, which are also called cytokines, to, uh, in response to, to that. 
Um, and there are good cytokines, which help reduce inflammation. And there are, bad is probably the wrong word, but then there are inflammatory cytokines, okay? Um, and what can happen when you're, if you get really sick, is that that release of messengers, that release of cytokines can just become overwhelming to the system. And that's going to cause all the symptoms that you're seeing and hearing from these kind of bacteria and, and viruses and things. It, that immune response um, makes you sick. You don't feel good when you have all of that stuff going on. And if it becomes too overwhelming for the system, you can get into deep trouble. You can, you can get really sick and need to be in the hospital. Lyme patients are going to know what this word is, cytokine storms. They just know it by a different term because we call it a Herxheimer reaction. Got it. It's the same thing. Same thing. Okay. Yep. And what are the common triggers for that that you found? So with Lyme, generally, you know, with this kind of Herxheimer reaction, it's kind of a die-off reaction. I've also called it a healing crisis. When we start to kill off these infections and they release all of their toxins into the system, that spurs on this cascade of signature, their um, messenger signals um, to our system. And it's in a system that's already overwhelmed. If you just, it doesn't take a lot to like push the system over, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very common when you start to treat these infections that people get worse before they get better as they're kind of working through that whole reactive process in the system. I've noticed personally through the years, my quote unquote triggers for that can be varies, you know, from time to time. And it just sort of something that might've triggered me four years ago, no longer triggers me, but it might be something else now. <laughs> That's just been my journey with it. Um, okay. You were one of the first doctors to use peptide therapy in Lyme patients. How does this treatment work and how would someone go about getting it? I use them by the way. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Peptides are great. Peptides are little amino acid chains and they're signals that our body uses for all kinds of things. And we can use them therapeutically to affect change. But they're a naturally part of occurring part of our system. So your system's kind of used to them already. So the side effect profile of these things tends to be extremely small, extremely small. Um, and there are a lot of different peptides out there. Uh, one of my favorites is thymosin alpha. This has a lot of research and science behind it. It's being studied in chronic infections like HIV and hepatitis, as well as cancer. So a lot of anti-cancer properties to it as well. And there are no severe side effects shown up in the, in the data for this, which is just unheard of. You don't hear of that kind of stuff, right? Um, but for example, so the thymus and alpha comes from the thymus gland, which sits in your chest and helps you make T cells to fight infections. Our thymus gland actually gets smaller as we get older. Um, but thymosin helps to stimulate that immune reaction, helps you fight off infections. Um, it's really good antiviral, lowers inflammation. Um, and just generally people start to feel a whole lot better when mm -hmm. they're on these kind of things. Mm -hmm. It can really be a nice missing link to help people get into that really full on healing phase um, after you've kind of been beat down by attacking all the infections for a while um, with very minimal, minimal side effects, which is great. Um, and it's just another therapeutic tool that we have to help people really get better. So would you recommend the injections being your first choice for taking peptides or is that the only way to take them? No, there are multiple ways to take them, but yeah, I really do like the injections. They're pretty, um, systemically absorbed and, um, it's annoying because you have to give yourself a shot every day, but it's actually not that bad and they can really affect some good change, but there's multiple ways. You can take it orally. There, you can take some in a nasal spray form. So yeah, there's a lot of different kind of ways out there. Okay. And is there a good sort of budget-friendly way to take peptides? <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> They're not the cheapest stuff in the whole wide world. Um, and um, there, I, I would recommend all the prescription versions of them. You definitely can. There's some non-prescription versions out there, but I do think that the prescription versions are better. But yeah, they're not the cheapest stuff in the whole wide world. And those we can find with our integrative doctor, I assume? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I was um, just hearing that Case Integrative Health, which you founded, just brought on an integrative neurologist. Can you speak to tick-borne illness and the brain? 
Sure. Yeah. The brain is one of the favorite places <laughs> for tick-borne infections to go. And it's going to cause a lot of inflammation in the neurological system. So there's a, it's really super, super common to have neurological symptoms when you have these tick-borne infections. And it, that can range from numbness and tingling in your extremities to just all of a sudden new severe anxiety. That's, mm. that's a symptom that I'll see too. Um, autonomic nervous system issues like POTS. Brain fog is really common. Trouble thinking clearly, getting the right words out. Um, and headaches is another big one. Uh, fatigue, even that can be neurologically systemic. So yeah, the, the neurological system is definitely one of the favorite places for these, these things to go. And that's part of why it's also been implemented in things like as a cause of possibly MS, Alzheimer's, um, ALS, Parkinson's, mm -hmm. can cause a lot of those symptoms. And so how would your neurologist there, how would they proceed with treating a Lyme patient, just generally speaking? Yeah, so she's, I mean, she's going to kind of attack it like she would any other functional medicine, you know, patient who comes in with neurological symptoms. So you have to kind of look and see, um, you know, the why. Why are you having these symptoms? Let's look at your gut. Let's look at your diet. Let's look at your exercise. Let's look at your nutrient levels. Let's, you know, kind of do a full assessment and see what else um, could be going on uh, that's um, affecting your nervous system, making your nervous system react this way, and how can we affect change there? I see. I uh, I actually this was one of my main complaints when I finally got my diagnosis seven years later was the fact that when I ended up at my second neuro neurologist who said, "Okay, we're going to do the battery of tests," you know, he said, "We're going to do that. Rule out the eight big ones." And I said, okay, you know, and I was in so much pain, I could barely sit on the table. And he went down the seven or eight that I was going to be tested for, including MS and lupus and um, some of the other biggies. And they were going to take two weeks to get back to me with those results. And never once was Lyme or tick-borne illness on that list of big ones. And I feel like they're not interconnected, but they are. And they, I feel like they're just sort of a hair apart and they can lead into certain, I mean, certain things can lead into certain other things. And I just walked away after my diagnosis with Lyme disease going, how is that not on the neurological top eight to 10 things to check for right off the bat? Agreed, agreed. And it should be, it should be. And a lot of that goes back to the fact that we're just not training physicians properly about these infections because they don't think about them and they're not on that list. You know, yeah. our, our integrative neurologist, Dr. Moffey definitely looks for it. That'll save a lot of people a lot of time. So you're so busy and I wanted to know how do you keep yourself mentally charged during all your long work hours? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, it takes a lot of work, actually. It's, it's, yeah. it's an effort. It's a daily concerted um, effort to make sure that I'm taking care of myself, too, because I have to fill up my cup as well. I, I'm a little silly. I wake up really early so that I have some time by myself. It's my time to wake up slowly. I'll do my meditations or whatever kind of thing I'm working through, read my book. Like That's my me time. Um, I have a three-year-old at home, so after work is her time. You know, I compartmentalize it a little bit, and that's so like I get a break. I, I, when I'm at work, I'm at work. When I'm at home, I'm I'm at home. I'm with her, um, and so I, that those kind of breaks and those the, that scheduling, I guess, um, is really important. And I I try to get out in nature as much as possible. I listen to a lot of music, take some Epsom salt baths every once in a while. You just have to make sure that you're filling up your cup too. But you have to. You have to find that time. You have to make that time because sure. everybody will say they don't have enough time, but you do. You just have to make it. You have to force yourself on a daily basis. Absolutely. And just yeah. find that window. And, and how do you find your uh, supporting your immune system for yourself the best? I mean, I guess my, our listeners will want to know because for me, that's the key to having episodes out of nowhere is just staying on top of my immune system. So what's your trick? Well, I'm very fortunate here because uh, we have IV therapies. So I can get IV therapy boosters on a regular basis. 
um, ozone being one of my favorites and high dose vitamin C um, is another one of my favorites. Uh, try to get those every other week, every three weeks or so, just to kind of keep my system up and running. Um, make sure I'm on the right supplements um, to help support things. And you know, it's good to follow along with a doctor who can monitor your blood levels, but you know, vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, um, vitamin A, fish oil, probiotics, you know, those kind of things. Um, diet is extremely important. So, you know, that COVID stress eating is not helping any of us keep our immune systems up. So more fruits, more veggies, um, less processed food, no fast food, no sugar, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and your top supplements being? For just kind of general immune boosting, the kind of the basics are vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, those three, kind of those, mm -hmm. that's your main core. Um, vitamin A, probiotics and fish oil are kind of the second tier. And then there's a whole host of things that you can take to help just kind of keep the cytokine storms down. Um, things like quercetin and resveratrol, glutathione, um, uh, SPMs. You know, there's, there's a good handful of stuff that you can be taking. I think it's, I think it's good at basic stuff, but I think it's also going to be important to work with, you know, an integrative doctor who's used to dealing with these chronic diseases who can help figure out specifically what you need in their histories that will help figure that out. But there's lab work and things that we can do to help figure that out too. And do you think that supplements and herbs and even peptides to that matter will be something that we would take for the rest of our lives, so to speak? Probably. <laughs> um, you know, you can get a lot from your diet if you really, really, really focus on your diet. And most of us just don't have that time or energy to focus that hard on our diet. Plus, we live in a really dirty world. It's very toxic. So I do think that we pretty much everybody needs help and support keeping that system clearing you out. So, I, you know, I put people on a lot of stuff when they're in treatment, but my goal is always to get people down to a very small handful of things to take on a regular basis just to keep them going. Mm -hmm. It's not to stay on a list of 25 things every day or three times a day. Um, it's to try and get it down. But when people are on treatments, they, they do tend to need a lot more to help yeah. them through it. But yeah. Sure. I've, uh, I know just through yearly blood work, I make adjustments with my daily supplements each time. I might. Uh, last year I took two out because they were, I was at a healthy, good level. And so anyway, I'm always adjusting. Mm -hmm. And it was my integrative or functional doctor, I should say, that finally found my chronic EBV. And I know she went through a couple of cycles of testing. How do you go about testing for CEBV and how common is it with Lyme disease patients? It's pretty common. Um, I see it a lot and it's one of my initial tests that I do and I, I typically just do some regular general labs but I look at about four different markers for Epstein-Barr so there's different kinds of antibodies and early antigens and EVNA and all these things that you can look at and you start to look at the patterns and you can kind of tell if it's a reactivation or kind of chronically activated or not. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of think of it as like immune system whack-a-mole so most everybody has been exposed to Epstein-Barr, usually by the time we're out of high school. And it's kind of like chicken pox. Once you get it, you always have it. It's never going to go away. And we can kind of keep it under wraps. But when your system's over here trying to whack down <laughs> Lyme disease or Bartonella or whatever, no one's paying attention to the Epstein-Barr. So it creeps up and it can stay up. And that those kind of chronic viral reactivations can make you feel really crummy too, just in and of themselves, it's been implicated in chronic fatigue syndrome and, and things of that nature, and um, even some cancers as well. So mm -hmm. I do think it's important to monitor those and make sure, and usually what I've seen is that if I can get the Lyme under control, then the Epstein-Barr will get under control, but not always. And so it's, it's worth looking at the viruses as a piece part of the puzzle to see if they are staying chronically reactivated, because you got to get on top of that too. Okay, and can that ever be healed 100% or is it a genetic situation? There may be some genetics at play there, for sure. And it's never going to go away. You're always going to have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and what about um, the MTHFR gene? What can you enlighten our listeners about that gene? Oh, the famous gene. The famous gene. Um, you know, I think that 
when we look at, when it comes to genes, I think epigenetics are much more important than genetics. Genetics are kind of what we're hardwired with, the MTHFR SNPs and COMT SNPs and all these other um, sing, uh, SNPs. Um, <laughs> um, single nucleotide polymorphism, there we go, <laughs> is in there somewhere. Um, but really how we can turn those genes on and off is a much more important tool for me. That's, I pay more attention to those aspects of it than the actual genes themselves because they're not even necessarily abnormal. It's not abnormal to have an MTHFR SNP. It's actually pretty normal. Like a lot of people have variations in these genes and they can affect your methylation, which affects your ability to detox and it affects your energy and mood and these things. But you can kind of play with that and look upstream and downstream and see how well that process is working and you can use different supplements and things to help moving it, help get that process moving. You can have problems with those pathways, even if you don't have the SNPs in your genes. But how you turn those genes on and off, like I said, plays a big role. And so the epigenetic aspect of things is way more important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that's going to be lifestyle related, diet, stress, toxin exposure, sleep, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's where I put my focus when it comes to those. Good to know. Um, well, I want to thank you, Dr. Ke Kelly, for informing all of us today. It's been such a pleasure getting to pick your brain and making you accessible to a lot of people that don't have access to integrative medicine. And um, I want to just throw out there for more information, you can find Dr. Kelly at on Facebook at Case Integrative Health or on Instagram, Instagram at Case Integrative Health and also on the internet at www.caseintegrativehealth.com. And I hope that you will join us another time and maybe do a little Q&A with some of our listeners live and just in, keep bringing awareness to Lyme disease. Thank you for all of your work and what you do. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, you know, help, helping to spread the word about these infections. This is important stuff and affects a lot of people. You know, and this is what we're here to do at Case is help get people feeling better. Yeah. Great. You're, a, you're such a benefit to your community. Thank you. Thank you. Have okay. a good one.